আমি সবার দৃষ্টি আকর্ষণ করছি আপনারা দয়া করে সবাই আসন গ্রহণ করবেন যারা চা কফি নেননি ব্রেকফাস্ট নেননি তারা ব্রেকফাস্ট নিতে পারেন আসন গ্রহণ করবেন এটাই আশা করছি সবাইকে শুনতে পাচ্ছেন শোনা যায় আপনাদেরকে প্রেজেন্ট করেছি আজকে ওই ক্যালেন্ডারের প্রথম প্রোগ্রামে আমাদের প্রাইমারি কেয়ার স্পেশালিটি কেয়ার যারা প্র্যাকটিস করেন তাদের জন্য তাদের লাভ লাভ হয় উপকার হয় ওই ধরনের কিছু টপিক্স আমরা ঠিক করেছি আমি আপনাদেরকে এই টপিক্সগুলো সবাইকে দেওয়া হয়েছে আগে তো আমরা আজকে যারা দীর্ঘদিন ধরে প্র্যাকটিস করছেন অভিজ্ঞ আমাদের পরিচিত সবাই তাদের কাছ থেকে এই মূল্যবান টপিক্সগুলো আলোচনা শুনব এর মধ্যে আমাদের একজন শুধু ইনভাইটেড গেস্ট আছেন সেক্সুয়াল হ্যারাসমেন্ট ইন দ্য ওয়ার্ক প্লেস আমরা একজনকে হায়ার করেছি প্রফেশনাল উনি আসবেন একটু অবতরণে আমি প্রোগ্রাম এখানে শুরু করছিলাম আজকের প্রোগ্রামের শুরুতেই আমাদের চ্যাপ্টারের সম্মানিত সভাপতি প্রেসিডেন্ট ডক্টর মাসুদ খন্দকার উনি বিশেষ কারণে আসতে পারেননি উনি আগেই বলে রেখেছেন উনি আসতে পারবেন না ওনার জায়গায় আমাদের প্রেসিডেন্ট ইলেক্ট ডক্টর মোহাম্মদ নাবি সিদ্দিক উনি ডক্টর সিদ্দিক ভাইকে এসে আজকে প্রোগ্রামের উদ্বোধনী বক্তব্য রাখার জন্য অনুরোধ করছে ডক্টর মোহাম্মদ এবি সিদ্দিক প্রেসিডেন্ট ইলেক্ট মেয়র চ্যাপ্টার আজকের এই প্রাইমারি স্পেশালিটি ওয়ার্কশপ এটা আমাদের চ্যাপ্টারের এই প্রথম অনুষ্ঠান এই ওয়ার্কশপে আমরা চেষ্টা করছি যে কিভাবে প্রাইমারি কেয়ার যারা প্রাইমারি কেয়ারে আছে তাদের কিভাবে তাদের কোয়ালিটি এবং তাদের কোডিং এবং তাদের কেয়ার কিভাবে উন্নত করা যায় সেই জন্যে একটা ওয়ার্কশপ করা দরকার আমরা মনে করেছিলাম এই জন্যেই আমরা এটাকে धन्यवाद लेकिन ওখান থেকেও আপনারা অনেক কিছু জানতে পারবেন এবং এরপরে আমাদের মধ্যে উপস্থিত থাকবেন 
um, Mr. Mayan Pozel, only sexual harassment in one place. So the Mulaman of the four and pay among the K. Certificate of Program Government. I'm going to ask you about the Shabai. Mulaman is busy. शुन्बेन एवं सार्टिफिकेट का गुण करवें। यही बोले आमी आज के यही वर्षों के गुण करछी। एक बार आमी जाची आमदेर यही यह चैप्टर के शादर उस बाद अब आधा उस बाद के एक बार बोलती अनुसार बोल चलो करो जन। आधा वो उस बाद ही जनरल सेक्रेटरी बामना यह चैप्टर। थैंक यू Thank you, Dr. Siddiq. Uh, I again welcome all of you. Uh, so with no more delay, we will go into topics. Uh, this uh, topics I think you all have uh, in, in the table uh, and the speaker's name and designation. Uh, the first we have uh, billing, coding, and documentation. Muhammad Hussein, who um, actually uh, another the young physician, uh, he could not make it. Uh, he actually told us before, and uh, he requested Dr. Bonali Hassan uh, to present, uh, you know, in favor of him. So I request Dr. Bonali Hassan, who is an internist practicing in Jamaica. We all know her. Currently, she is serving as young physician secretary of New York chapter. So, Dr. Bonali Hassan, topics billing, coding, and documentation. Mintu Bonali Amra Shabai, Mohamed Hassan K. Chini, young physician, he is getting into the residency program this year. So, he is actually uh, made this up. Bonali, uh, please. Discharge 
like four four um, uh, four ninety uh, nine nine four ninety five nine nine four ninety six. Together with this, we can put another code, and that we can get some thirty dollars. Hearing testing annual, we can do also. We can do the annual. Um, we can do the allergy testing, peripheral vascular disease patients and uh, diabetic patients, uh, vascular insufficiency. Those patients we can do ABI also, and uh, we can get some reimbursement from the Medicaid and Medicare as well. Other than we can have, we can do the actually primary care. We can do halter, and I got the halter monitor on the on the first. Uh, uh, first table and that is also we started uh, practicing and building also. So couple of quotes, uh, these are the new things we can introduce. Some of the our physicians, uh, senior physicians and uh, everybody is maybe they are also doing all this but we can as a, we are new practitioners who are coming up, they can always uh, use these quotes. This is a tonometer we can use for the eye pressure measurement. Post discharge medication reconciliation code. This is 111F. We can get $30 reimbursement along with the uh, 99495 and 99496. Uh, one is for between before seven days, and another one is for after seven days. This is the audiometry CPD codes. I think. Uh, uh, I, I have the, um, if you anybody interested, I can give the quotes also. I put all those quotes here. Actually, for the billing purpose, we think about the three questions. Component of the evaluation and management and coding. Is the patient is new to us or established? What level of the history, physical exam, and medical decision unit, decision making, MDM, uh, is recorded? What is the appropriate service code for the care? These are the three things we should be concerned. <clears throat> Just one second, the make changes. To organize this, this program, we nearly need your help. So this was a great contribution for you. I would like to, let's uh, give them a big, a big hand. Where is Dr. Khandakar? Oh. Can you please stand up for me? Dr. Khandakar? He's in the Himalaya. He's in the Himalaya now still? No, no, he came down. He came down, all right. And next is the Dr. Hassan. Can you please stand up and we can give you a hand. Dr. Rafiya, please stand up. And Dr. Petudara. Thank you for your contribution. Yeah, we just uh, found out that from he's arrived to Everest. From, Mount <laughs> from Everest to Mount Everest to our base on the Everest. And congratulations for your achievement and it inspired all of us. We were eagerly waiting for you. And also I should thank Checking to my pulse friend. Socks. Checking pulse socks, what is the CPT code? Yeah, we can do that too. We are doing it actually. And I would like to recognize the Morning Star Supplies. Uh, Mr. Zinoy Joseph, uh, can you raise your hand? Actually, I know him from uh, Square Hospital uh, in Bronx. I worked there for four years with him. He was our social worker, and now he started new practice for her quality healthcare supplies. Um, he's here, and he'll be with us with our convention also. He told me. So I want to give a hand for him too. Thank you for coming. And then next is the Accurate Diagnostic Lab. Uh, Dr. Ram Gupta, and uh, he's here. Uh, we want to give a hand for Dr. Ram Gupta. Thank you, and stay with us. We, 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 we will be very helpful for you, and you will be very helpful for us, too. And then New York Life um, is from our Bangladesh uh, agent, um, Dr. Mr. Fahad Chaudhuri. Um, thank you for coming, and this is New York Life. So. It's a, it's a, um, we started our, our workshop actually last year. Um, that was a nice presentation. Dr. Khandagar, Dr. Zakiapa, everybody was there from both IPA last last year. And there was a, um, we already had all this conversation on the, on the left hand side. 
all these topics we mentioned last year, and it's in YouTube also. We are going to update in our BMN and new chapter in our uh, Facebook and in our agenda. We are going to update that. So, and this one also we video recorded, so we can uh, also update it. Can we start now? But it's not. Yeah. New patient is the like you know not received professional service from our group like the specialty subspecialty in the past three years like and the hospital clinics or resident faculty they are they are also new patient but if the established patient has not been in our practice for three years that patient will be counted as a new patient this is a new code will be going there nine nine two zero three or nine nine two zero four even nine nine two zero five. The new patient outpatient visit um, is uh, 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 actually everybody knows, but I just want to say a little bit. The 99201, 99202, 99203, 99204, and 205. And those are the things we can document the HPI, AROS, exam, and MDM, and the time is like 10, 20, 30, 45, and 60. So we have to make sure that if we put all, all the patients in, 99204 and we see like 100 patients then 24 hours is not uh, it will be like the day will be more than 24 hours so that is a very good clue that what we are doing or sometimes we don't remember like if this was a big patient we are thinking at a, in a short period but we have to keep in mind this is the return patient the established patient these will be the 99212 213 214 and 15 the same thing like the time is a 10, 15, 25, 40. And medication decision making is the number of the diagnosis, self-limited, established new problems, stable, worsening addition of testing plan, amount and the complexity of the data review, ordering tests, reviewing the tests, obtaining the record, overall risk of applications. Standard documents is the chief complaint, history, physical and assessment plan. Prescription drug management. So I will just go for the bottom line, so to make it quicker. Continue current medications may not be good enough. More reverse documents in necessary. Current medication reviewed in context of patients' current code conditions. Side effect drug and drug interaction lab reviewed, XXX and XXX. Continue A and B drug at current dose. Bottom line, the current Continue current medication may not be good enough. More reverse documentation needed, like current medication reviewed in context of patient's current condition, side effect drug or drug interactions, lab reviewed XX, YY, continue drug A and B at current doses. So documentation is actually important. Part of documenting decision making is data lab count document if you discuss the test performing medical management and document when you review the test, EKG, X-ray, urine, rapid uh, strep. Documentation is important if history from others. Uh, documentation data from all record we have to write down, review is not, is not adequate. Elements from EMD, the cities. History still complain, bullets have like HPI, and we know actually these things, the modified factors, things. Uh, durations, associated science symptoms like if there is a pain, we always document it. We know that. The location, quality, severity, duration, timing, context, and modifying factors. 1997, this is the revi revisited things. And same thing actually, but we just have to... Uh, these are from 1997. So history and uh, changes in the history is the... For established patient office visit and when relevant information is already contained in the medical report, practitioner may choose to focus their documentation on what was changed since the last visit or on pertinent items that have not changed, need not re-record the definite list of required elements. The changes in 2019 is this. If the medical medical reviewed and document the review, this is a change actually. So they can take the history physical for us and we just have to give you it and document it. Updated and reviewed element from previous notes can count for current note. 
billing provider must review and document that, that it is reviewed. This is not really a change from previous regulations. Physical exam is, I think, it's the same thing. These are the complexity of the medical decision makings. And there is some new quotes also. I have been written down. I, can, uh, I can make copies. Those are like, if we stay, if you like spend more time, like we finish uh, face to face, We've, there is some like a um, $20 and even $60 we can get. These are the prolonged service face to face. New codes for new payments. These are, there is some G codes also. I have these things, I can email it to you back. Email it to you. It's, it's, it's something new. Prolonged service also, we can get money. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. So our next presentation, the topic, I will look here in medicine practice, and the speaker, Mr. Shivani Purichita, Dr. Jaggi Hussain, Dr. Jaggi Hussain, she is an internist, um, she is the yeah. vice president of South Asia IP. I know, I know. Can we request Dr. Jaggi Hussain to come and speak? First slide is the population versus health care expenditure. Next slide. Although the United States spends more on health care than all other developed nations, it has higher rates of medical care related mortality and shorter life expectancy. Compared with other high income countries, patients in the United States pay more for prescription drugs, undergo more diagnostic tests, and pay the highest hospital and physician prices for procedures. To compare this, to compare this out, unsustainable spending, health policy organization and other expert groups advocate implementing high value approach in patient care. Health expenditure is highest in USA, more than 12% of the GDP. But life expectancy is not highest in the USA. It is USA is in the third position in the life expectancy. for the prevention of cardiovascular disease or cancer. 
insufficient evidence for use of vitamin D and calcium in to prevent fracture. Rather, supplementation with vitamin D and calcium together increases the incidence of kidney stone. Only vitamin is indicated during the child bearing age. Next slide. Is the high fellow healthcare, the collaborations with the like connections between members of the care trip and patient engagement and empowering the patients to be their own advocate. Difference between the high fellow care and the low fellow care. Low fellow care is the unneeded diagnostic testing. The test we don't need, suppose for the prostate cancer screening, we don't need the routine PSA. And because there is no recommendation of prostate cancer screening nowadays. And next one is the unneeded imaging. The patient who has the back pain, they don't need the X-ray or MRI without any warning sign. Use of branded drugs when the generics are available. If we prescribe the omeprazole delayed release, its price is $1,250. But if we write the capsule omeprazole, only cost $7 to $10. High value here is the flu shot every year and the appropriate cancer screening and prenatal care, and also coordination between the members for the complex diseases. By this, in the high value care, if we practice high value care, we are saving more than 55 billion each year. And by low value care, we are spending 340 billion each year. So see the difference between the high value care and low value care. So in the primary care practice, this is the, this is the time we have to practice the high value care. Next one is the integrated approach for the high value care. Integrated approach means the communication between the primary care physician, care member teams, and also the psychiatrist and, and a, a, a social worker. Everybody know about the DSD? What is the one of the uh, delivery system reform incentive program? One of the quality incentive program from CMS. It started in 2016, and 2019 April we are in the fifth year of the DSD. And DSD is the way to high value care roadmap for the high value care uh, and also the value based contract and. Uh, components of the district is the integrated delivery system, integration of primary care and behavioral health services, care transition to reduce 30 days readmission, healthcare at risk intervention program, evidence based strategies of cardiovascular disease, evidence based strategies in diabetes, evidence based medicine strategies for asthma, tobacco use cessation, chronic disease prevention. Integrating behavioral health services for the primary care has to integrate their patients who has the psychiatric problem and the substance abuse disorder with the psychiatrist and care coordination team. And by, by integrating behavioral health with the primary care, and we can reduce the admissions, uh, hospital admission also reduce the complications of the patient. And in that, in, by that, we can save a lot of money. Who are the, um, who are the members of the behavioral health integration services? Primary care physician, psychiatrist, behavioral health care manager, and clinical staff. And as a primary care, we can bill for the this behavioral health integration services, and we can get the reimbursement. Next one is the transition of care. Transition of care is very important because transition of care is the post-hospital discharge and 50% of the hospital admitted patients face medication error as adverse events during post-discharge. 40% of the hospital admitted patients face diagnostic error at the time of hospital discharge, while 
test results is pending or require completion of a diagnostic evaluation as an outpatient. Although Medicare patients, 30 day re readmission rate is 25%. And transition of care, we have to we have to quote for the post hospital discharge, that is 99496, that is transition of care management within seven days of discharge, and 99495 is the transition of care within 70, 14 days of discharge, and 111F is the discharge medication review. And all the insurance company paid that 100 to 126 dollar for the post hospital discharge. And this post hospital discharge patients we can get in the internet, I don't know about other uh, EMR, and it comes in the, like our dashboard through HealthX and the SOMOS. Every day morning we get the patient who are admitted in the hospital and what, what is their status, they are, they are still in the hospital or they are discharged, everything and what to follow up. If you go to the HealthX, then you will get everything. Next one is the chronic care management. Chronic care management is the comprehensive care management. This, this, this chronic care management, we can, this is the, there is some components of the chronic care management. The every uh, uh, practice has a chronic care management team and 24 seven access to the, uh, like uh, for the patient. And what are the conditions we can do the chronic care management? That is the Alzheimer's disease, arthritis, COPD, atrial fibrillation, autism, cancer, cardiovascular disease, depression, diabetes, hypertension, hypertension, infectious disease such as HIV, AIDS, and asthma. And chronic care, we also build, we can build it, and we usually get a reimbursement from the chronic care management from $70 to $100. The, uh, the code for chronic care management is 99490, 99487, 99491. And by chronic care management, these are the complex patients, we can prevent the hospital admission and their complexity. And the patient who has the visit the, the month of the, suppose patient has the visit in the month of March, we cannot do the chronic care uh, code. But the month the patient does not have any. the previous slide. The patient who has the admission, or the patient is admitted in the hospital, we can, cannot do the chronic care uh, billing. But patient who does not have the visit this there, that month, suppose the patient did not come in the month of April, we can call the patients and we can, uh, like, you know, and call can be done by the primary care physician or the team members of, like, you know, from the office staff and the, how patient is doing and patient is compliant with medications and uh, then we can bill it. And I'm give, giving some quote for the preventive visit. Preventive visit is the, this is 18 to 21 years, the adults and, and the more than 65 years that are very important because up, whenever, these are all, all the quality measures and at the end of the year, the, all the insurance company ask for that. And in the, this is the preventive care visit there is some uh, like your counseling code we have to use. That is the tobacco counseling and also the alcohol and drug counseling and depression counseling we have to do. And this is very important, all this code. And some of the insurance company for this counseling, they give us the reimbursement for $10 for each counseling. And for the above 65 years, the patient, we have to do the that uh, functional status, medication needs documentation, fall risk, depression screening, and also the advanced care planning. And for this advanced care planning, all the insurance that pays us like around $70 to $100. Nine, nine, that is the code for the advanced care planning is 99497. Next uh, slide, even the patient delivered the baby in the hospital, but if uh, patient uh, like for the primary care physician we have to follow up with the postpartum also because this postpartum visit is one of the quality measures for the insurance company and they also all, they give us the reimbursement 
uh, around 100 to 126 dollar if we put it. And next, uh, um, there is some something that documentation for, and this is very important because all these are quality measures: the chlamydia, Pap smear, mammogram, dilated diabetic eye exam, and FOPT colonoscopy. Chlamydia we have to do every year, but Pap smear, 21 to 30 years we have with that, uh, we have to do only the uh, like Pap smear, but without HPV because. 21 to 30 years, we cannot do the HPV screening because they are to, their concentration is very high and it can become false positive. And from 30 to 65 years, we have to do pap smear with HPV and every 65 years. But patient did the pap smear five, three years ago and this year patient did not do the pap smear but we have to do the documentation because the patient did the pap smear three years ago and patient pap smear was negative and next pap smear is due and this is very important because documentation code, the insurance company, they pick up that documentation code. Even the patient did it and we don't document, the, we don't put the documentation code, then the quality team will not pick up our pap smear or the mammogram. Mammogram also every two years. The last year patient did it, this year patient is not going to do it but we have to put the documentation code, the 3014F, because we have to write the patient did the mammogram last year, and the mammogram report is this, and next due is in the, after one year. And dilated diabetic eye exam, the ophthalmologist or optometrist does it, but we have to put the documentation code 2022F, because we refute the document, and these are the very important for quality. FOPT and colonoscopy also. Patient did the colonoscopy eight years ago, but we have to document every year. This is the 3017F. We have to put the documentation code, otherwise the quality tip will not pick up. Next one, I'm going to ACC coding and the RAP scoring. And this is very much important for the primary care physician because our funding depends upon the ACC coding with RAP score. For older individuals, typically have the higher RAP score than the individuals with the young age. And according to RAP scoring, our insurance bills us. And I'm giving some example. The patient who has diabetes and with no complications, and patient is on oral medication, their funding from the insurance will be less, suppose like $200 PNPA per member per month. But if patient has the diabetes with polyneuropathy, patient has the diabetes with CKD, and patient has diabetes with retinopathy, we have to put that code. And patient is on insulin, we have to put that code, code G79.4. Because if patient is on insulin, insulin is a costly drug, and patient needs more funding. But he, as a primary care physician, if we do not code that, the funding will be less because if the funding is less and the patient cost is high, that will be in the negative because in the value base, this is very, very important because the every part patient, they give us the funding. If patient is a complicated medical condition and if we don't put the code, then it will be like, you know, negative, negative for the provider. And also the patient is now with the CKD and patient is on dialysis, we have to put the dialysis code. Otherwise, the, they, will not fund, they will not give us the fund for the dialysis and there will be the negative funding. And next one is the, we have some code for the diabetes managers, like, you know, complicated, uh, like, I, I gave it and if anybody wants this uh, code, I can email them. And what is the benefit, high value care benefits? Lower cost, cost and the better outcome, higher patient satisfaction for the provider and better care efficiency. Pair is a stronger cost control and reduced risk. Supplier, alignment of prices with patient. And key points to take home. We have to educate the patient. If patient is asking for like heart exam, 
screening, we have to educate. If patient is asking for multivitamins, calcium, we have to educate the patient. Education, education, and it's very important. If we educate the patients, don't go to the ER for the, like, you know, upper viral infection, lower back pain, neck pain, the, it, the hospital admission will be less. Because our cost, like, usually, utilization is more in the ER admission, ER visit, hospital admission, and if we can reduce some hospital admission, and then we can reduce some cost. And we have to do the post-hospital discharge follow-up with the patient by health tricks or somos, and this is very important. And in post-hospital discharge, we we uh, do the we see the patient and we counsel the patients about all hospital admissions and the medications, and we can reduce some hospital admissions and we can save save money. And coordination of the teamwork is very important for chronic uh, conditions, and we already discussed with the. Uh, like what are the conditions for the chronic care and proper ICT and CPT coding and I already discussed this is the coding is very very important because some of the ACC coding if you don't do it properly then our, our funding will be less and some of the CPT coding if we don't do properly then the health insurance company they, they will not pick up our like work and as a primary care physician we have to know the price of the medication. This is very, very important. I gave one example, but omeprazole, whenever we write the omeprazole, usually pharmacy gives the omeprazole delayed release, and it's the $1,250. And, but capsule omeprazole is only seven to $10. If you write the hydrocortisone, always from the pharmacy, they ask us to give the clobitazole. But clobitazole is $450. And hydrocortisone, simple hydrocortisone, is seven to ten dollar. And in this value-based practice, wherever we are going, and these are the prices and utilization is very very important. If we don't practice this one, then every provider will be negative, and they have to compensate. This is very very important. Thanks. Bye. Care management. Dr. Jackie Hussein for a nice presentation. Um, our next speaker, Dr. Jabir Khan Rayyan. Uh, looks like Jabir Khan took a new name. <laughs> Dr. Jabir Khan Rayyan. Uh, he's the president of South Asian IPA. Uh, his topic is way to below base contract. Way to below base contract. Dr. Jalakhan. Ornali wants to say something uh, before the below base comes. Actually, I'm a game killer journalist. I'm going to do my presentation. I'm going to read you today. 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 সবাই যে কাজ করে তাদেরকে কিভাবে আমরা অনেক একটা সুন্দর পরিবেশ দিতে পারি এবং তাদেরকে কিভাবে আমরা আমার আনন্দময় সময়টা কাটাতে দিতে পারি ইন আওয়ার প্র্যাকটিসে যে দে ক্যান এনজয় দে ক্যান লার্ন সেটার জন্য আপনাদের সবার প্র্যাকটিসে কি করা হয় অথবা আমাদের কি আইডিয়া সেটা এটার মধ্যে লিখবেন এবং তারপরে সেটাকে দশের মধ্যে নেক্সট পার্সন যে বসবে তাকে দিবেন সে দশের মধ্যে সেটাকে একটা নাম্বার দিবেন যে যেরকম পিজা পার্টি বা পিকনিক হোয়াট এভার ইউ লাইক টু ডিভ দ্যাট রাইট ইট ডাউন সো নেক্সট পার্সন উইল গিভ এ ভ্যালু লাইক আউট অফ টেন হাউ মাচ ইট ইজ দেন দিস হ্যাজ টু বি গো অন ফর ফোর টেবলস সো টোটাল আউট অফ ফোরটি আমরা দেখব কার অফিসে অথবা কার কি আইডিয়া থেকে কে কত বেশি নাম্বার পেতে পারে আমার মনে হয় আমি বোঝাতে পারছি অথবা আমি সবার টেবিলে আসবো থ্যাংক ইউ Please, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bonali. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to workshop for practicing physicians sponsored by BMNA. I highly appreciate BMNA to take this type of workshop. Uh, 
Uh, so, I have a question here. Today is Sunday, April 15, 2019. Is anybody happy with me? No. How about today is Sunday, April 28, 2019? Anybody disagree with me? Disagree? Disagree? No. Okay, we'll talk in this one so my presentation is why to value-based contract. So why we are so interested to value-based contract? What is this in value-based contract? To get the highest quality of service with lowest possible cost. It's very difficult to get high quality but low cost. So why we are here, why we are so interested to this, in Sunday morning, we are here leaving our family at home. Why we are here? That one person can give that answer. One person, I introduce you that person right now. This is Franklin, he is the answer. He can give you all the answer why you are here. In God we trust. Everybody knows that. This is the flag of USA. We are citizens. This is our flag. This is 50 states of the United States. Everybody knows that. So now let's talk about a little bit of healthcare industry in USA. How is going on? Which direction we are going? The USA country of 50 states with 325 million people uh, population in census of uh, 2016. In the USA, men average life expectancy is 76, uh, female is 81. Women live longer than men. Why? I don't know the answer because we are under stress. There's the reason. I think. In the uh, US population, 325 million. Most of the population, almost half of the population lives in only nine states. Those are California, Texas, Michigan, Ohio, Illinois. New York, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Florida. So we have a lot of patients to see here in New York State. Total of 1 million actively licensed physician, MD and DO, we are practicing in New York, uh, in USA to see 325 million people. Average 290 physician per 100,000 population, female makes up one third of those physicians. We said 2015, there were little more than 42,000 first year medical residents and fellows. You see the AMC report, what is the report? The US will face a shortage of between 61 to 94,000 doctors by 2025. So there are a lot of job for the physician and a lot of demand. I submit my resume in 2004, still I'm getting phone call email almost every day because my number and uh, email at the same so that I'm getting a call from the recruiting agency. You see the population in USA, 1975 there's a two, 216 million and 2015 is 321 million. But it is the hospital, number of hospital. In 1975 is over 7,000, but it's 215, the number is 5,500. Population is going higher, but number of hospitals is going lower. You see the hospital bed. 75 is 1.5 million, now it's less than a million. You see the situation, the census. In 1975 hospital is 7,000. And now is uh, 1915, I believe, yeah, 5,500. So hospital is going opposite direction. See the consequence of that. This is the consequence of the everyday emergency. Any hospital you go to ED, you will see this is the scenario. Don't think that they love each other, they want to stay close together. Or this is after an earthquake disaster. This is an everyday situation in emergency department. They are the way we are treating the patient in a developed country. You see, this is not the, I can guarantee this is not the ICDDRB cholera hospital in Dhaka. How do you know this is not ICDDRB? Every person here is white like me. So this is the USA.
You see the uh, hallway. American are very smart. When they make the hospital, make the hospital, they make the hollow wider. So then half of them they can treat the patient and half they can walk. This is the fatal in US developed country. Average waiting time in year, one hour. This is average waiting time in USA. I'm not talking about the New York. I'll show you the picture for New York waiting time. Let's see. The, let's see the picture, real picture in New York City. <laughs> the real picture in New York City. No comments necessary. How the hospital expenditure in 2000? You see the 415 billion dollar. 2010 double. 2016, 1.1 trillion dollar. We are spending a lot of money, but the quality of service we are providing to all this world. If you consider the budget, last year budget, this is healthcare 3.3 trillion dollar, three times more than the education budget. The difference, 867 billion dollar. Healthcare is the highest budget, 3.3 trillion dollars. According to the World Health Organization, USA spent almost 10,000 dollars per capita annually to give treatment to the US population. This is more than 17 percent of GDP. This is highest in the planet. The second highest is German. This is below 50 percent of USA below 50% but giving higher quality. In uh, England, they are giving very good quality but their GDP is 8.4%. But they, with 8.4% they are giving higher quality service. You see this? USA, USA very high this the, for the uh, healthcare, spending a lot of money. This is a different country, India is last is India. Healthcare is spending by types of service. You can see the product. Hospital care is 1.1 trillion dollar. Press keeps on 328 billion. These two I make great because of the value is contract we are, going to, we are going to talk these two. So that's a mega. Physician and clinical service 664 billion. Other professional service, physical therapy, optometry, poetry, 92 billion dollar. So a lot of dollar we are spending with poor quality service. This is a senior citizen, doesn't have the party, 20 different medicine, thinking what he can do. I didn't make this picture, this is a, a government picture, it's a medical, a medical website, I took this picture. So you can see 2007, that was 434 billion dollar and 2017, 707 billion dollar for Medicare. And the Medicaid, largest insurance in USA, covering one in five Americans as Medicaid. 2007, it was 332 billion, now 2017 is double, almost six billion dollar for the Medicaid. With, after spending all of the money, Let's see the what the outcome. That will make it upside down. The Commonwealth Funds Research did a research on organization for economic cooperation and development, OECD countries, 11 nations of the developed nations all over the world. They need the quality. Among the 11, US position is 11. Worst. Very sad. Other countries are England, France, Germany, Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, Australia, Canada, New Zealand. This is very sad for us. Spending that much money, 70% GDP with the lowest quality in terms of quality. Why the quality is low, you see? 25% of the primary care service provided by nurse practitioner in all over the USA. If you go to the rural area, this is almost Half of the services are provided by nurse practitioner. 
If you go to Bangladesh, I don't think anybody will see a nurse practitioner. They will look for a doctor. American undergoes cancer screening significantly higher rate than people in any other developed country. Very access to MRI CT scan and other services. Very easily you can get. You see, I have a headache for last two days. Why don't you do a CT scan? You never know. You never know. Go to a CT scan. This is for the male CT scan. This is for female work. Don't go this machine. I'm joking. If you are a man, don't go near this machine, I think. This is for the mammogram. Bone density. What do you do with a whole body? Doctor, do give me a whole body MRI. Put me inside the machine and do whole body MRI. That's the way you are spending money. Over utilization, unnecessary utilization. We will see the consequence of that. Over utilization, what is the outcome of that? In 2007, there are 72 million CT scans were done. What is the result? The outcome? 29,000 cancer, new cancer. That is the outcome. 15,000 will be fatal about this 29,000 cancer due to exposure of CT scan. 2016, 80 million CT scans are done in this country. You see, the cancer possibility related to CT scan in USA. The red female, the blue is male. Between 35 to 55, the highest risk of the cancer development of the cancer. If the radiation chart, if you do dental x you can get five microsievers very low, dental x chest x 100, mammogram not a significant number, 400, because naturally you can get 3,000 radiation annually. So if you consider annual risk of not doing anything, you can get 3,000, seven times more than the mammogram. You see, this is virtual, the colonography, 10,000, highest is abdomen and C, pelvic CT scan, 15,000. We are doing so many CT scan. I have problem with the gastric. I have this problem. Why don't you need a CT scan? If you don't need a CT scan, I change my physician and go to another doctor. So next doctor see, oh, this doctor came, this patient came from another doctor, so let me give him a CT scan. And what is the consequence? End up with, I show you before, how many cancer. But I really surprised one thing. Mammogram is only 400 years. But mammogram age limit was increased from 40 to 50. So there is some controversy. Was it right decision or wrong? I'll show you in the next slide. You see. When the mammogram era, mammogram started intraductal carcinoma in C2 in cyto risk increases, but based on that, you cut down the mammogram from 40 to 7, 50 years. If you do 100,000 mammogram between the age of 40 to 70 years, you will end up 125 breast cancer. Of those 16 people will die. If you don't do mammogram, 1,000 people will die with breast cancer. By doing mammogram, we can save 20 to 25 to 30 percent female from dying from breast cancer. So this is very significant. Don't think that the other patient can You are 45, you are 40. No, you don't need to do mammogram. Use your judgment. This is very important data. I didn't make any of data. I don't have the authority. I just collected this data. So the tools the value based contract initially show that you have to go to improve the quality and the lower the cost. So to improve the quality is can PCMA in the market, patient centered medical home, everybody knows that. I don't think so. Everybody knows that one of my friends who did residency in Brooklyn Hospital, he's from 
Egypt, I call him, brother, what is the situation about the IP? So the physician, uh, Egyptian, they cannot pronounce P. They say, what is IPA? I don't know, this is not IPA, it's IPA. I understand this is IPA, what is that? Then I asked, did you do PCMH? What is PCMH? So I, he has never heard of the PCMH or PCMH. So made the concept is uh, medical home as even First introduction of the term by American Academy of Pediatrics in 1967, the concept. After that, four organizations, American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Family Physician, American College of Physician, and American Osteopathic Association combinedly implemented this PCMH in 2007. Main purpose is coordinated healthcare for patients prevent possible medical situations from arising, provide increased quality and safety of medical care approved by practitioners. Approved practitioners. This is the home, patient-centered medical home. Here is the patient and family. Comprehensive, continuous, coordinated care to the patient, accessible for the patient, and physicians are accountable to the authority must be accountable. If you take the piece of which money, make sure you are, you are accountable there and you have to be accessible to the patient easily and continue. This is the home for PCMH. The four different companies recognize that certificate. Majority comes from NCQ, National Committee for Quality Assurance. They give majority of the certificate. Some of the certificate comes from Europe. Utilization Review, review Accreditation Committee. A little bit come from few from Joint Commission and a little bit accreditation. Few from accreditation as well. Not significant number. So our value base, the second part is how to lower the cost. This is very important. One is to give improved quality. Second, to lower the cost. Now, Let's change the gear back to the New York State. We are in New York State, so we have to think of New York State. 20 million people in New York State. 6.3 million have Medicare. A lot of patients to see. That's why Dr. Hassan Bayo office is very busy. Because a lot of patients have Medicaid. What is there? To address underlying healthcare cost and quality issues of New York medical program, Medicaid program, Medicaid redesign team, MRT, this is very significant, it created in 2011. Due to Medicaid resident team, they save over $17 billion in New York State. From the $17 billion Governor Como allocated $6.4 billion to give to the uh, physician. But if you take this money, you have to do accordingly. More than 200 initiative, initiatives were created as a result of MRT, Medicaid Redesign Program. Can we start on the line? Among these 200, three major MRT includes the Delivery System Reform Incentive Program, district, Health Homes and Managed Care Expansion. Delivery system part from reform incentive program. The DZ main purpose of DZ to reduce 25 percent unavoidable hospital admission by five years. 25 percent in five years. This is the main purpose in an action. Seven states completed the DZ already. They claim success in more than 95 percent. This is the book. What the book? And practically how much is true, I don't know. Two states are still participating among these two New York State. New York State will finish December 31st, 2019, this year. Three more states are in the process of getting this ring. Next, hot topics. I would like to emphasize a little bit about this one. Everybody is familiar with this. Hold here. 
होम हेल्थ केयर और हेल्थ होम केयर एवरी सिंगल प्रैक्टिशनर और बर्न आउट अबाउट दिस हु कैन एलिजिबल फॉर एनरोल इज सो हैव हाई कॉस्ट कॉम्प्लेक्स क्रोनिक कंडीशन दैट ड्राइव हाई वॉल्यूम ऑफ हाई कॉस्ट इन पेशेंट एपिसोड्स एंड लॉन्ग टर्म इंस्टीट्यूशनल केयर not the person is working goes five times in the mosque not this number of the person for home care eligible you see that a health home is a care management service model whereby all of an individual care giver communicate with one another so that all of a patient's needs are addressed in a comprehensive manner so mainly main target is to stay healthy out of emergency room and out of hospital this is the main target of home care here yeah. the quality for home health care who is qualified must be home bound must require skill care this to uh, mandatory must be home bound i mean the home bound criteria next slide and require skill care on a part time or intermittent basis to improve maintain prevent or further slow down the health condition a home bound patient cannot leave home for non medical reasons for more than 16 hours per month this is looks like if you read the jonathan swift galibers travel there is eight condition almost like that condition like to sir cannot have more than 5 absences from home per month not 5 times go to the post in the father make sure cannot leave home for more than 3 hours at a time on average and medical absences are limited to treatment and cannot be provided in home this is the criteria i didn't make any of this criteria i collected from cms any anybody can collect from cms be confined to home need skill service be under the care of a physician receive service under a plan of established and reviewed by physician have had a face to face encounter with physician or allowed non physician practitioner in pp home care expenditure last year 92 over 92 billion dollar so government has an eye on that if you see as hcfa broadens its investigation of home care fraud and abuse physician must familiarize themselves with the eligibility criteria for home care service and must comply with them so review the they review the forms 40% of the home care are not correct with the reason is patients failing to meet home confinement criteria this is the reason 40% the fraud next is in mrd last one is managed care expansion the new york state department of health has established a goal of having virtually all medicaid enrollees served in a care management by 2019 now came to the final round the value based contract i give all the introduction why we are value based going to value based contract this finally we actually reach this is a volume based it was always volume based now value based quantity of service to quality of service no more quantity how many patient you see that does not matter for quality service you provide that is the matter is a two dimension to three dimension it was only the number and quality now the government at the cost you must participate the cost you are responsible for the cost of the service in the past 2 plus 2 is less than 5 this is correct answer 2 plus 2 is then more than 3 correct answer but do the answer not correct uh, accurate now This is the accurate question. Answer. 
The Medicaid Department of Health, all the insurance company used to accept those questions before answer. Now they don't accept because this, between three to five, you can create one million number. So now it has to be exactly two plus two equal to four. You will get the money, you have to give the quality. If you cannot give the quality, there will be downside things. Don't take your money. At the end of the year, you see the negative balance. Cannot pay the mortgage. In 2006, Michael Porter and Elizabeth Tisberg, Tisberg introduced the value based agenda in their book, Redefining Healthcare. Eventually, it implemented value based healthcare from their idea. Michael Porter and Elizabeth Tisberg. You see the value which started actually from 2008. It will make upside down eyebrows will be raised, so many legislation, so many programs. Starting from 2008, gradually is going to, that's why I give previously some explanation about the PC image this G, because the door that the vehicle goes to the value based contract. That's the reason we are going in that direction. From 2020, you must participate in value based level 2. So understanding the move towards the value-based payment system is very complicated to give high value with lower cost. If you try to lower the cost, quality will go down. If you want to give the higher value, cost will go high. So it's very difficult to balance. Value-based will be the middle value-based. There is a balance between cost and the quality. <coughs> See the patient value. If you want to give value away, if your cost is increased, this is inversely proportional, everybody knows. If your cost increase, the value will go down. If you give quality service, value will go high. There will be money will come to your pocket. If cost is increased, money will go from your pocket. Value-based healthcare, the payment model, there's a different, multiple different models of the value-based care. It's very difficult to explain in this very short period of time. There's only pay for coordination, pay for performance, bundle payment for episode of care, or shared shared savings programs. Program. There's upside and downside. In value-based level one, only upside, but in level two, there's 20% downside risk. And we have to participate that claim it our cities. So different models. You have to choose one models. The contracting parties, who can contract? Medicaid, MCU can contract, IPA will contract, SCU accountable organization, they can take the value based contract. Provider directly can take value based contract. You have to care for that. You don't have to join an IPA to get the value contract. Provider directly can take the value contract, but there is also risk associated with that. Management contractor, they can get the value contract. So how is it? Shared savings agreement, MCO, managed care organization will give the contract to the IPA. The gap of the IPA. Take all the responsibility. MC will not take a minimum responsibility, not a single dollar. They will take their money. They will dump on the IPA. Okay. If you cannot make the money, give money back. If you cannot give the quality. So IPA will give the contract to the provider. But they are on the same side. IPA is very risky part and IPA. If you cannot make money, another year, 20%, you can go back to the MCO. Or MCO can give directly contract to the provider. There's two models, two methods of contracting, whatever you choose. How the contract cycle starts? There's a negotiating time with the IPA and the managed care organization. It usually takes nine, three to nine, six months to formalize what type of contract you will take. Then it will submit to the Department of Health. And Department of Health usually takes three months to approve or disapprove, whatever they will do. After three months, contract will be executed. 
after executed, Department of Health and Insurance Company will monitor, monitor how you are doing that. What is your strength and what is the weakness? And after that, again, you will go negotiate and table. So this cycle will go on and on. Always there is a downside risk in value based contract. Downside, as I mentioned earlier. So how to minimize the downside risk? This is very important in the value based contract. How to minimize, how to put money in your pocket. There's two things. One is income generation and loss prevention, asset protection. You have to generate an income and you have to protect your asset and also loss prevention. Income generation. How can you generate the income? Proper documentation coding, very important. Dr. Zaki have mentioned that one. The pro proper documentation coding. How can you raise your money? Increase baseline funding. It's very important to increase your baseline funding. If you have hundred dollar, you can go and spend fifty dollar. If you have only fifty dollar, twenty-five dollar, you cannot spend that much. So we have to have your pocket heavy. And then increase the quality to get the fund. This is very important. So we'll go a little bit on that. Many things, how can we increase the funding? This is very important to for the rep score, as Dr. Zaki mentioned, risk adjustment score. Risk adjustment score. There is 69,000 ICD 10 CM code. ICD 10 CM code. 69. So above the 69, 9,500 code is attached with 79. ACC code, high RKL code, those are the money in the high, high RKL, RKL code. So you have to increase the REV score. In the REV score, one REV score is equal to $9,050. I'll show a little bit of example. Diabetes without complication, you see the REV score is 0 0.118, which will give $1,000. If you put a complication, neuropathy, retinopathy, then it's three times. Three, 0 0.36, which will be $3,300. So this is very important. You will increase your baseline fundings. This is just another example, very short, which is too much. You can get it from 5,000 if you know our specificity. In the middle, you can get 9,700. Even if you go 19,000, same thing. This is all legal, proper documentation. And then loss prevention. How to prevent the loss? Prevent avoidable hospital visit, lower the utilization, unnecessary test procedure, unnecessary referrals, avoid polypharmacy, use generic medicine as possible. It's very difficult to prevent unnecessary ER visit. Very patient in the middle of the night will go to the ER. You have to have patient's education and 24 hour access. I can give you very uh, tricks, easy tricks. How can you prevent the ER visit? Just see this one. This is the way you can prevent the ear visit. This is the doctor the pulling the head, the leg, and the patient. Let me go to ear. The doctor is working hard. Don't go to ear. Thank you. you see this is the situation. We are in this condition now. Home care, health care, work care, Medicare, all this care is killing. But care. this guy still is here. He is surviving, but the next day he left his office. He is out of order. <laughs> we improve. In our health expenditure, we improve a lot of things. This is the first ambulance in this world. There is one guy sitting lying over there. This guy is driving the ambulance. Quality improve. This is a very good ambulance, air ambulance. With all this technology, I mentioned, as I mentioned, our quality is still is down. This is the old technique of seeing the patient, old method. You see the new method. Everybody is busy seeing, a, busy seeing the patient. Documentation, this is very important. You don't need to have contact with the patient. If you can document, you are safe. You can get money. So in spite of all these efforts, there is no improvement of the quality. The main reason for two, loss weight in the physician, 
everybody try to protect themselves. Protective medicine. One in three physicians has been sued by S55, one in two lawsuits. You see, there's 7% seven, seven of medical liability claims decided by trial verdict, 88% owned by defendant. I have to make sure. So in 2012, you see that $3.6 billion medical uh, malpractice insurance payment. If the doctor didn't need to call me, <laughs> attorney is waiting for it. Lack of pa the, another reason, lack of patient engagement. Patients are not engaged in this country. Never ever patient has no accountability, <coughs> no responsibility, easy accessibility, lack of education. Patient one what they can do. But this is now the IPI is mentioned that you can go participate individually or you can join IP, IP, whatever. This three is the physician and this is the hospital. And you have the choice which one you can go. This is up to you. I got to know that I have to make it short, I think. I don't have time. Osman is standing, so he, he might kick me out. So. <laughs> so, but make sure you participate in any of this according to your choice. Because you have to survive. At the end of the day, we have to survive. If you survive, then you have to be one of this. If you I have this. If you give me one day, I can show a video. If you are out, we'll call you by time. This is really good. Yeah. That's how we need sound. Sound. Is there anyone who can fix the sound of the cable with the laptop? Any technician? This is Matt, sorry, my name is Yeah, this is Dr. Admissions of the PR. We have four new admissions to wait for. Four? Sure, give me the name of the diagnosis and I'll be right there. The first is a train wreck. 20 problems in 40 medications. Second, pain drug fever. The third, the smoker with end stage COPD. And the fourth is a little old lady, grainy, with worsening of dementia. Worsening of dementia? Do we admit that? Basically, it's done by family over the weekend. They want to drop off grainy and have a great day. They promise they crap for a second. Is there even a deal that you so far? Not yet. The nine is very young. Hi, Mr. Oran, I'm sorry. Hi, this is Ms. Murphy, Mrs. Stevens, and we'll go to Ms. Van on the floor. Okay, is everything okay with her? Yes, yeah, she's okay. We just need you to come in, evaluate, document, and sign the incident report. Sure, I will, once I get a chance. That doesn't seem to be urgent. I have like four patients waiting for me in the ER. Please, Dr. Make sure you come in and see Mrs. Stevens. We need to follow the protocol. Sure, I will.
Thank you, everyone. Just say one thing after watching the last presentation. Boy, I'm glad I'm not a doctor. Sorry. Oh, boy. Uh, okay, so uh, we're about to make your jobs even harder. No, no. But the government has done that already. Uh, my job is to make it a little bit easier for you, at least this one, the last one. So let me bring you up to date. I'm going to try to answer this a little bit quickly. There is a new law that doesn't just affect health care. It affects all employers in New York State and New York City as well. There's some differences. I'll discuss that. And that is there are new laws regarding sexual harassment in the workplace. And there are requirements for you as employers to have certain elements in place in their office. Now, a little bit of background. So my, my area of expertise is actually OSHA compliance, which is safety. Okay? Um, I've been doing training and OSHA and HIPAA training for my clients, and this new regulation came out. And my clients asked me, can you please do the training for us? And I told them they're free resources, and I will point you to free resources you can use for your staff. Okay? It doesn't have to cost you money. But they asked me, they wanted a person to do it at least the first time. So it's an uncomfortable topic for some people to deal with. Um, and I was a little surprised as I started doing this by something. So I want to start off first by doing a little bit of an informal, just a little survey. And then at the end of the training, I want to ask this question again, because was, this was very surprising for me. But by a show of hands, and please don't be shy, and no one's going to hold anything against anyone, but I'd like to know by you know, raising your hands, does anyone here think that they have an issue in their workplace? of sexual harassment taking place in their workplace. If they think that this is a problem they have, please raise your hands. Okay, don't be shy. Okay, so no one has any problem with this in their workplace. Excellent, so what are we doing this training for? Okay. So I'm gonna come back to this question in a second. But you know, we didn't define what sexual harassment is here, right? Like one of the questions I have, can I, can I, can I comment on a person's clothing? What a person's wearing. So I, I learned this a long time ago when I got when I got married. So I'm married now for uh, you know 28 years. But I learned this pretty early on. So my wife asked me, we're going to some place, we dress up. My wife says, Mayor, does this dress make me look fat? So I look at her and I said, does this tie make me look stupid? How do you think I'm gonna answer that question? Like, there's no way to answer that question. Right? No, of course not. It makes you very right. So I learned early on never to make, you know make comments about you know the way uh, people clothe us. But that's just an indication of like, you know, so what, what is harassment? So let's start off what the law requires of you. And let me give you a little sample of training that you could give over to your, to your staff as well. So first of all, as I said, both New York City and New York State came out with requirements. There's slight differences between them. So let's start with New York State. Under New York State law, you all must have a written policy against no. sexual harassment. The written policy will say that you'll provide training. And it has to have a mechanism in place for employees to report harassment and other issues inside. So I mean, you have now. You all, I see this video. So all you guys have lots of free time to sit down and start writing new policies, right? I'm sure you will have plenty of time. Okay. So all these resources that I'm going to mention, um, I am going to email Dr. Osmani, uh, Osmani a template from New York State. You get the template, and you'll just the word document, you'll put in the name of your practice the name of the person they should report to, and you'll be very easily be able to have a written policy. So you'll get that in the email, okay? You also need to have, so this is a sample policy, so what something looks like. And again, you don't have to use this, you can modify it as you need to tweak it, but this is directly from New York State. It's a nice little policy. You also need to have more wallpaper for your office. You guys will have lots of wallpaper, minimum wage, and OSHA, and HIPAA notices. So now there's some more signs. Okay, so we have to have a sign up about, uh, this is New York City. New York City requires you to have a notice in English and in Spanish. What if you have no Spanish employees? It doesn't make a difference. You have to have a sign in English and in Spanish, hang up with the notice. I will be emailing this as well to Dr. Money, who will get copies of these notices and notice you have to hand out. Now, training. You must provide your staff with training. The training has to be interactive. Uh, New York State requires you to do training even if you only have one employee. Even a single employee, you have to provide training. New York City, only if you have 15 or more employees, they consider interns to be employees for this purpose. So people, if they have an intern or temp, someone that works by you for more than 90 days, or more than 80 hours, they are considered employees, and therefore you would require to do the training. There is 
online training available from New York City for free. The employee should take it during work hours. If you want them to take it at home, that's fine. You don't have to pay them for their time. It's 45 minute training. At the end, they pick out a certificate and they give you that certificate. You must document the training. Okay, so that's. Now again, I will send out a link to that training. You don't have to use that training. I'll also send you a PowerPoint you can use if you want to do it in the office, which I think is a little better because you can have conversations about it. And you know that training has certain required elements. Let's start, let's get right right away to the to the main part of this. So what is sexual harassment? So we know that there are a lot of protected categories in New York State, friendly as well. For example, it's not just you know person's gender that they're protected from discrimination. You cannot discriminate based on religion, race, etc. But the requirement for training is only on sexual harassment. So sexual harassment is any type of harassment that is based on a person's gender, gender identity, the fact that they may be tra transgender, the way they view themselves as their gender. Okay, so any harassment that makes someone feel uncomfortable in the workplace. So what can make someone feel uncomfortable in the workplace? That could be a lot of things. So there's a big spectrum. Let's take things that are just straight out like criminal, right? Or a person, you know, let's go physical, extreme, right? Rape, assault, whatever. So that we're not even talking about. That's call 911, that's, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's under the penal code, that's a, a, a crime, okay? Harassment will be based on a person's gender, making the workplace hostile to a reasonable person would be hostile. So what could that be? So you would think this wouldn't apply anymore. I had this in a nursing home. I do a lot of work with nursing homes. We had the OSHA was coming in as part of a program, was walking into the nursing home. The nursing home asked me to do a walk through a safety walk, which is my main area of expertise. Uh, safety. So I was doing a safety walk through. This took place two months ago in New York City. I'm doing a safety walk through a nursing home, and I go into the machine shop, which is where you know all the, the maintenance department, they have all their equipment there. And I open up the door, and what was hanging on the wall? The machine shop. Posters, pictures of people not wearing, maybe there were medical you know, anatomy posters, they, they weren't wearing clothing, these people, and then these pictures on the wall. Now, it was all men that worked there, all the pictures hanging on the wall were females. Now, that's in the workplace, that's harassment. Why is that harassment? Not pictures of employees, but it makes women feel bad. Right? Are you looking at these objects? And that also would be considered something that could be harassment. Now, what's your obligation as the employer? So understand that the penalty for harassment in the workplace can be up to a quarter of a million dollars civil penalty. Plus, there could be other emotional, the person has the right to sue and be awarded additional damages. Okay, so this is a very serious matter. A company or practice is responsible immediately if the harassment is being done by a principal of the company, by an officer or the owner. That's automatic. The business is liable, period. You also are liable if a supervisor is doing the harassment. A supervisor is a, re is a representative of management. So if you have a supervisor who's the one causing the problem, you need to get rid of them. You are responsible. Secondly, a, a supervisor that knows about harassment must take action, must report it, even if an employee doesn't complain. So in my scenario, the department head, the supervisor of the maintenance department was really wrong because he knew about this, even though he didn't work down there, he had his own office. He full well knew this poster was up there. Now, no one complained about it, it doesn't make a difference. If he saw that's something that could be considered harassment, the supervisor has a responsibility to report it and act on it. Once a supervisor knows about harassment, for all intents and purposes, the practice knows and the company is liable. And your supervisors have to know this. And every complaint must be investigated. You must let your staff know who they complain to, who can they can complain to, what the process is. Okay? So once you get a complaint, every complaint must be investigated. And very important, you cannot take retaliation. Okay? So I'm going to give you an interesting scenario. I want you to think about this. Let's say you have a person working front desk, a very busy practice, and there's a guy working. I'm going to, I'm going to go with typical examples, but of course harassment could be a woman to a man. It could be a woman to another woman, man to another. It goes anyway. As long as it's related to their gender, to their sexuality, that's harassment. Let's do stereotypical scenarios. So a woman comes into the office, she works at the front of the desk, and she got a nice new haircut. And one of the co-workers, the guy looks at her and says, wow, that's a really, really pretty, that makes you look very nice right here, though. She feels that that's harassment. And she goes and she falls in play with the supervisor. Now, first of all, does that seem to be harassment? No. No. 
I mean, depending how Zora is done, the way I presented it, that's a nice secret, that's a compliment, right? Nothing hits the blow against compliments of people. So, but she took it as a resident, so she did complaints. So you investigate, people were there, and you say, well, what was it told? No, it, it seemed, all the other workers say, it seems like it was just a compliment. Okay. So you explain to the worker, this was not a resident, this was a compliment, right? But then you're thinking about it, you know what? If she's like so sensitive, and she's gonna view this as a resident, this is gonna be a problem. So you know what? I'm gonna move her hours so she's going to work now on the weekend when I have no men working by the front desk. So she used to have hours, she used to work, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and now I'm working her three, three hours. She's working Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You're on the weekend now. Why? You know, just we're moving you around. Now, there was no harassment, but you penalized her. You moved her to a different shift. Why? Because she complained. She didn't lie. She didn't make She thought that that was harassment, even if it wasn't. You cannot retaliate against someone merely for making a complaint. That's an employee's right. An employee can be taught, no, this is not harassment, this is fine. But the point is, you may not take any retaliation. That's something to be careful about. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean that's a get out of jail free card. Someone's coming late to work and they say, oh, I don't want to get fired, I'm going to complain, harass me. No. If, if a person's not performing, if first the person's breaking the workplace rules, of course, they can be sanctioned just like anyone else. But you can't merely, because they complained, hold that against them. And by the way, an employee can complain about harassment to someone else. Someone's making comments to someone else in the work, and that person who the comments are directed to are not, is not complaining, but the other employee is saying, this makes the workplace a hostile workplace. And they can do that kind of complaint. Okay. There are different types of harassment. So there's harassment, you know, we said physical, literal, you know, real, you know, physical contact. And then there's harassment, uh, like verbal. Now we make comments about a haircut, fine, clothing. I think there's a distinction you can understand between clothing and how you look in the clothing. Now, once you start crossing the line and making comments about a person's body, that really is something that can very easily be crossing the line and people have to be careful about. It. What about relationships in the office? Okay? So really there's nothing wrong. People date, people meet each other at work, and this happens. Where it, ha where it crosses to a problem is when they go out and the, one of the people involved says, okay, that's it. You know, we're done. It was nice, but you know what? Let's just keep it a professional level. And the other person wants to try igniting the flame again. Leave a little gift on the desk, a little nice note, hi. Okay, we've made the workplace uncomfortable based on their gender, based on their sexual identity, and that's crossing the line into harassment. Okay? Now, when I said relationships, I saw some people right away say, no, 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 no. What you probably were thinking about is this is a big issue. Relationships between supervisors and people who work underneath them. There's a big issue called quid pro quo. And this is, of course, Hollywood, we saw this, and this is the issue which is where a person in a position of authority tells a person, you know, you can move up in this workplace, but you know, maybe you go out for dinner. Or, of course, worse, right? So that, of course, is illegal. A person can't. Uh, use the fact that they're in position to give a positive or negative review, give the person a better assignment, use that against them, that's clearly harassment, that would be, uh, that would be uh, illegal. A person has recourse, they can go to, of course, we, we want them to start by reporting it in-house, and we have to teach them, as part of our training, we have to tell them they have three ways to do a complaint, beyond just in-house. They can go to New York City and complain, that's on the poster that we show you, then there's a New York, Human Rights Commission, they can go to the state and complain, and they can go to the federal government complaint. Each one can give their own penalties. So this is serious stuff. Okay. For New York City, they have a year to complain. If they don't do the complaint, they have three years to go to court. For New York State, they have, they have three years. And um, federally, they only have, to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, they have 300 days. They cannot sue federally unless they went first to the Equal Opportunity Commission. So they want to file a complaint within 300 days of the date of the harassment, which harassment. But we have to let them know that, what their recourses are, so people know that. And people will take this, this stuff seriously, what they see in the office. Okay. Now, here is the thing I've been holding out on. Remember I said, raise your hand? Now, you're responsible for creating a safe workplace. You're not allowed to have any harassment. You're not allowed to tolerate any sexual harassment in your workplace. So it's not just employees. If you have an employee 
who's working for you and they are being harassed by someone else that you have control over, you have to protect your employee. Who is that? Your patients. You have a front desk and a person comes and every time they come to that office and they start flirting with the front desk or making comments or escalating it, and if it makes your employee feel uncomfortable, they can complain and you must take action to stop that. Now how do you stop that? And by the way, it's not just the front desk. It can be to a nurse, it could be to a doctor, a physician's assistant. The patient says, no, 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 here, you want to see, you sure you don't want to examine something else, right? They make a comments and they make your employee feel uncomfortable. That is harassment. If, you're, if you find out about it, even if there's no complaint, if the supervisor finds out about it, you must act. You must talk to your patient and explain to them that this is a medical office and this is a, a, a you know, behavior that will not be tolerated. This is not a bar. Okay, this is, this is a medical office, this is a workplace, and the comments are entirely um, inappropriate. I had, I did this training, I was in a dental office, a pediatric dental office. So it means the patients and parents are coming with their children, and they told me they have a problem with one of the patients who has a child there with them, and bothers the people at the front desk. Okay, so this is something that really happens out there. You have to speak to them. And if, what if the patient doesn't listen? Say, ah, don't worry about it, it's all good nature and they come back and they make the comments again, what do you have to do? You have to tell them they can't come anymore, they're not welcome. They're not welcome as a patient anymore, you will not see them. That is your legal responsibility. You have, even means losing revenue. Okay, you, because you lose a lot more revenue if you let your employees do the rest. Okay, you cannot tolerate it. Now, now, that I, now that I've mentioned patients as being the source, potential source for harassment, for making your employees feel uncomfortable. Let's do the raise of hands again anymore. How many people think that they have a problem with harassment in their office? I don't feel great, no. Yeah, okay. People, yeah, I mean, this is, I was shocked. Again, I know people are not feel comfortable. Uh, this, I was really surprised at, because you know, I come and I don't deal with patients. I come and I deal with the staff, I do my inspections, I do my trainings, I go out. But as I've been doing this, I can't say all the offices, but the majority of offices I've done training with they're all looking at each other, they're all talking about, oh, this guy, oh, that guy, oh, the doctor's friend, when he comes over. Every office has a story. And there's someone there who's making their staff feel uncomfortable, and that has to stop underneath these new rules and regulations. Especially, should have stopped earlier, but now that we have the awareness, this is something that really could be putting you guys at risk. Okay? So, to review, you need to provide training by your staff. You want to get this training done before the end of October 2019. Okay, to comply with both. Under New York City law, you have some more time, but you have New York City, New York State law, so you've got to watch out for that. So you're going to do that in, um, pretty much by mid-October. You're going to get your policy set up. You're going to get your posters um, hung up. New employees have to be trained also, typically within less than 30 days or as soon as possible. They're also going to be handed a version of this poster as a notice, so that everyone knows about it. You can say you know, is it? Make sure your training is documented. If you want to do the training yourself, that's fine. There's a PowerPoint that we'll send out but have everyone sign in. Very simple. Sign in, what's the topic? New York City, New York State, sexual harassment prevention. No dates, time, and everyone signs in. That's your paperwork. You keep that for three years. You need to keep that to protect yourself that you comply with it. And again, the policy is pretty um, you know, uh, straightforward. The training should have you know, examples. Not just enough to say no harassment. Examples like I gave. Like I told you about. So many comments about what people look like saying about raises or stuff like that. Give case examples, people have an opportunity to ask questions. That's a requirement of the law regarding the training, okay? And make sure that your supervisors are well trained. You're responsible for what happens out there. They can't simply ignore stuff. They have to know that you will hold them responsible. If stuff goes on and they're not doing their job and preventing the harassment, then you will hold them accountable. Does that mean docking them, suspending them without pay, or maybe even firing them? Because they're the thing. Now, one last point. We'll end with this, and this is just a very nice concept that will help you go to the workplace, which is you should teach your staff about supporting each other. You know, if the front desk, someone comes over and a patient is making comments to someone at the front desk, you can empower other people at the front desk. Say, listen, if you see something, you can say something. Say, no, excuse me, that's not really right to say that to her. Right? So you should teach your staff as well that they can do, be supportive of each other. Even if they can be supportive of each other in harassment examples, if, it happens, they die. if they feel uncomfortable you know, saying something, tell them, record it. Take out your recorder, record the conversation, or write down notes. So while the person's saying it, 
document the note. So this way you're supporting your fellow employee. They say, no, oh, this, this patient really bothered me. Like, yeah, she really, he really did it. This is what he said. These are the notes I took. So teach your employees as well as part of the training that they should get involved. If they don't feel comfortable getting directly involved, they can offer emotional support. And there's one final category that probably doesn't come up too often, but it's also protected, and that is um, stereotypes, sexual stereotypes. Think more about construction. Construction, like the truck driver or the thing. The woman's working there, and the men make comments. Oh, what are you doing in this business? You know, give the man to a job. You know, the job to a man. Don't, you know. So, same thing in healthcare, not so much today, but if it's a front desk where it's all women, and there's one guy working at the front desk, and again, I'm doing stereotypes, perhaps, but that's what you see, right? And then the women make the guy feel uncomfortable. What are you doing this? Okay, well, you're not smart enough to go to a doctor, go, you know, then they start harassing you, go, go become a construction guy. Leave us alone, we want to have our conversations, you're getting in trouble. That's harassment. Give a good nature, but if, you, if he feels like, I come to work and every day the women are going to bother me because I'm a guy, that's also harassment. So even harassment as a person taking a non-typical role, that would be an harassment. A person at the front desk, if you allow jewelry, you buy long care, and then you hire a man to work at the front desk, and he wants to wear the jewelry, he wants to come home with a dress, that's his right. You let the women do it as well. So we cannot discriminate or harass a person based on their gender identity as well. Okay. Any questions? I don't want to go over. Yeah, go ahead, sure. I know this is more sexual Okay. I mean, just, just being obnoxious and harassment. Yeah, okay, so that's, that's not really this. I mean, we can do the same thing. We would expect you to have a safe workplace. That crosses over. It's a serious issue in, in, in the hospitals. Um, in, in the, the amount of violence that's perpetrated against staff by irate family members, gangs come in, a person's been stabbed or injured, and they don't see them right away, they threaten the staff. These, these, you know, healthcare, it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a scary job sometimes. I do for nursing homes. And when, as I, when I first started working, I was shocked by how many nurses are getting hit by the, the residents. And they have to mention, they don't mean anything by it, but they're getting bit, scratched, kicked. You know, you deal with, I don't know, the for no reason they go and they, they punch the person in the face. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's the work, you know, violence in the workplace is an issue. But specifically on this matter, listen, if you have a person who has a temper, who's a patient who's doing it, you know, obviously we expect the, 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 the doctor to deal with that as well. That's not going to be covered by this. This is specifically going to be, Harassment that's based on your gender, you know, come, you know, a, 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 a rude joke. You know, there's this question: Who does it make the joke that makes people feel uncomfortable? So the first time it happens, it's probably not actual to find the guy. But the supervisor should tell that employee, like, listen, leave those jokes out of the workplace. But if the person does it a few times, is that asking? I'll, I'll tell you a personal story that happened with me, and it's, a, it's an interesting question. I don't know if this is to be sexual harassment, this goes to religious or. And I don't, I don't think it was me nature, but it didn't make me feel uncomfortable. So one of my previous jobs, I worked for a Wall Street firm many years ago, I was starting out. And I worked with a group of very nice people. But you know what they did is every Friday, they went for lunch, they went to the type of place where people were dressed and things there, and then I would never go. And they were very vocal about the fact they're going, and then the guy would say, come on, Mayor, why don't you come with us? And you know, I don't do this kind of stuff, it's fine, people go. But then, you know, every week, Mayor, what's the matter, what's the matter, you know? You know so, you know, it wasn't kind of, I, I wasn't a goal, it wasn't an issue for me, but I could see if I were doing it to a woman or something, that crosses into the, the sexual resume, really, right? The same type of thing. So anything that makes a person feel uncomfortable in the workplace, that definitely, if it relates to their gender, specifically, definitely crosses the line. And that could be cartoons, screensavers, phones, pictures going around of a pornographic nature, and makes someone work on a couple of that is, that is considered harassment. And that's something, again, quarter of a million dollars is a lot of money. It's built to truth. So, you really want to, it's, of course, it's not appropriate for the workplace. You know, but now you have a little bit of a financial incentive to make sure that we do the right thing. Okay, any other questions? Sure. Okay. Uh, two questions. Sure. One is, uh, one that, uh, those two papers that you showed us, yeah. uh, if you, anyway, yeah. uh, we can download and hang in our office, so okay, we have yeah, to apply. Yeah. To the New York State. No, no, no. You don't have to send anything in. Okay. The, the policy. You'll have a policy. Let everyone know about the policy. You can hand out copies to your staff. Okay. Um, again, you'll have to fill in the, the, the policy. The name of your practice. Who is the supervisor? They should go to to complain, etc. Right. Uh, the other ones are just signs that you'll hang up. One is a sign you hang up, just like all your other. You know, you have your your labor law posters. Yeah. So the problem with those is. Most people have the New York State labor law posters. You have federal, you have state. 
This particular poster is New York City specific, so you really need to get a New York City labor law poster. So, but like I said, this I will send a PDF of this to Dr. Osmani, and he can send, he will send it out to everyone. I was here to document that we gave the training to you. But again, you're going to have to document that you did that training for your staff. You can do it in person or this. I will have a link to the New York City website. The training is a little boring. It's 45 minutes long. And the biggest problem I have is, you know, they, they speak to you and they have the words on the screen. You can't, you finish reading it, you can't click ahead. So, you know, I, I, I did OSHO. My, my first OSHO class, I tell you guys, I had to take a 30-hour class. I did it online. It was the same thing. They read every slide to you. And if you're a fast reader, it doesn't make a difference. Like, I feel like, like, okay, so that's what it is. You, you have to go, but it's 45 minutes, and there's a certificate that printed up at the end, and you keep, they keep a copy, you keep a copy. And it's annual. The training is annual. Okay, so yeah, so this is, you've just lost productivity every year. Yeah, we know. Now, it doesn't have to be very long, the training. You know, this online one is 45 minutes. Obviously, you can do it a little bit quicker, especially to repeat type of training. you got to hit all those cases, examples, take questions, etc. So I will send you this. The second one, which is a notice. They're both, they're almost identical. One says the word notice on it, the rest of the sign is saying The notice is meant to be handed out to each person at the training. And the second question I have, sure. if a patient comes and tells me that he or she feels that the promised girl don't like her because she's maybe Hispanic or from African American, what, what do we uh, define as the harassment or what? I'll from the patient's okay, so, so that's a separate issue. When, if you're talking about your staff harassing patients, so there, there are... The patient more. feels that, that, because I'm Hispanic, you know, this right, 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 right. Okay. So, so the, the first thing you really have to do is, you know, and again, we're going a little bit out of my area of expertise, but there's, there's one thing I noticed when I work with healthcare, which is that there's a certain percentage of the population that are crazy. They are, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fact, it's a fact, whatever, whatever I, don't know what, I don't know how low that number is, but well, there's a certain number of you see in the street, they talk to themselves, they're walking around, they're paranoid, they're people hitting, they're, they're great, right? They all go to get healthcare someplace. So there's a chance some of these people are going to you as well. Delusional people, paranoid people, whatever, open up the right. So you may have the you know, misfortune of having to deal with one of them. Okay. And how do you deal with one of them? Well, you definitely got to investigate. If you have, I mean, today, you know, it's a really good thing in your, in your waiting room. Cameras is pretty well accepted today. The people not an example or something like that, but I think it protects you, protects the patients. And you see, you know, and you should ask other people. You know, I don't know how your front desk. You know, one person's a little harder. You have other people there. Say, what happened? No, the person kept asking. I said, please have a seat. She was offended. You know, I, I have a friend that has a, a coffee shop, and he showed me some videos. You know, the, 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 this uh, customer was really wrong, but they thought that there was some you know, issue of you know, discrimination. Well, they had a dog. They thought it was racism because someone didn't like the door. I don't know how that's racism, but it's racist because you can't do it. And they were screaming and they pushed another you know, customer. You know, but he has cameras so he can protect himself. So that's it. So you definitely document everything. Document the complaint, document. Now, what law that falls under, okay, under New York State, there are protected categories of discrimination, not just in employment, but in services. You're now allowed to deny services to a person based on their ethnicity or race. So it is a protected class. So if you say we're not going to see you because you're Hispanic, that would be something that would be protected on the could sue under as well. So definitely something you need to take seriously. But it doesn't mean that it's true. Okay? Good question. Any other questions? Okay, all these things you must document. Every complaint, write it up. However trivial, write it up. Who did you interview? I spoke to this person for this, I spoke to the patient, I spoke to this person, that's your protection. I investigated it and it wasn't meant in a bad way. The person misunderstood the conversation, they weren't talking about them, they were talking about someone else, whatever it is. Doc, and if it is, if, if it does cross this into what could be a reasonable person harassment or something that was inappropriate, it doesn't mean you have to fire the person that did it, but then document that. I had a speech with them, they spoke about why it's not the person who said they won't do it again. Again, if it didn't cross into an egregious matter, certain things maybe one strike in there, and you would know what type of things those are, right? You know, trapping the person, leaning over them, like touching, you know, there are certain activities that are really across the public areas that you don't need to get a second chance. Okay, any other questions? Thank you so much. And this will go to 3 year 5.7 by the end of 2016. Next. Your self-care Spending bills, uh, Jaber uh, showed it to us that the uh, US is the highest per capita, like now 10,000, and the lowest is in the United Kingdom. 
and in the middle, uh, I think Germany. And this is the this is the curve that United States, how this is going on, and this is what it is in the United Kingdom right now. So you U.S. healthcare cost uh, basically it's going to 3.65 trillion. Uh, even even it went to 2018. Next. So this is basically going into the hospital, fighting legal issues for hospitals and healthcare system, lawsuit against mandate to buy health insurance. This is what is the ACO's Affordable Care Act, I think. DIPA and data breaches, antitrust issues, false claim and whistleblower systems, the anti kickback system, recovery audit act, co-management arrangements, etc., and labor and employment issues and merger and teachers. Basically, this is most of them that apply to the hospital. Next. So, 10 big legal mistakes that physician could make. Number one is a problem to recognize. Failing to recognize problem. Number two, pursuing election actions against care may be an issue. Number three is document a failing to consistent, accurate and complete documentation. The bedside manner of a physician or the staff, and failing to designate a point to oversee ethics management is also one of the fundamental things that today's practice mostly comes for. <coughs> Next. I'm going a little faster because everybody's on. Paying big legal mistakes when charged with a civil or criminal fraud, trying to respond trying to respond without the counsel is number one. And then, failing to cooperate with the authorities, keeping your staff in darkness. You never know who is calling, you never know who is coming to your office as a patient and just taking notes and, and giving it to the Department of Health. So just be careful. Failing to respond fully, fully to application forms and relying on the advice of the counsel is an absolute defense. So when you are being sued, just be careful that do not depend on, on your uh, lawyers or counsel totally 100%. You can also talk outside and get some advice. Since from 1980 to 2015, the Blue Cross Blue Shield fraud unit estimates 4,700 fraud cases are opened annually. 4,600 of those claims are closed yearly, but interestingly, only 4,000 of them of those cases are referred to the law enforcing agency. There's a big variation from there to here, and 33 of those referrals ends to arrests and convictions even less 2,700. But it's still high numbers. There is a gender difference between when being sued and not sued. Uh, there is a big gender difference. GYN and the uh, specialist and the surgery are the highest here, 81% and 74%. Among female, the trend is less being sued. The male are sued almost the higher than in all the cases here, in all the subspecialties. Most physicians will face a malpractice lawsuit at some point in their, in their career. More than 60%, 61% of the doctors, more than 55, have been sued at least once. It's a AMA data sheets. And findings in 210 reports is based on the survey of 5,825 physicians. And this data is also from Physician Practice Information, BPI survey. Complaint received by the OPMC, Office of the Medi uh, Medical Professional Misconduct, 2012 and 2016. You can see this is going up. 2012 is 6,700, and 2016, I do not have any data, it's still from 2017 and 2018. So this is about 60% increase. The complaints, and the complaints are mostly coming from the public, as I showed you in my other slides. Next. So the legal mistakes that can lead to civil liability, what is it? So engaging in driving without permits or alcoholics or intoxications, becoming involved in business activity that seems too good to be true and you are involved in it. 
So just be careful about this failing to have a sufficient insurance coverage in case you have a problem, then, you know, and failing to have a pain coverage. And besides that, failing to consider umbrella policy. So always have an umbrella public policy for your uh, practice. And the leading causes of malpractice allegations today still the highest, highest malpractice allegations uh, failure to diagnose remains as the most common and the highest malpractice uh, allegations. Uh, that's not too surprising considering that a 2012 study appearing in the Journal of American AMA found that missed, incorrect and delayed diagnosis affect 10 to 20 percent of the cases. So just be aware. So, how do you prevent it? In order to prevent it, number one, familiarizing the risk factors that we have. The factors that from my first slide to until now, if you can familiarize it and make some kind of protocol in your office, you can easily prevent it. Number two, is common mistakes done in medical practice. So what is the common error that we can quickly survey and write it down? Third thing is preventing the administrative subpoena. So more, nowadays, most of them is happening right here. And preventing the civil and criminal, and then once it happens, how to really protect yourself more and compliance, that's where it comes. I'm almost at the end. So when can we do or avoid or prevent healthcare fraud? So you be informed and then follow all the legitimacy of these um, laws that we have. 100% to be compliance is pretty, pretty difficult. Even if we get to 50%, I'll say Alhamdulillah, we have done a good job. And the third thing, I think I'm done. And and to be to you are even a doctors already you are so you are most welcome. Just try to protect yourself today. Thank you very much and feel free. Thank you, Dr. Resu. Uh, if you have any question, uh, can... like everyone of us has a malpractice policy, but you said umbrella policy. What is the difference between oh, well, already existing and now yes, yes. umbrella government policy covers you very widely. Say somebody fell in your school, say you are driving, or in your car, you, you have given your keys to your second is going to get a punch, and he has an accident. Then what happens is, basically, they go behind you, they will find it out. Let me tell you one thing, one instance. In my office, one of my, one of my tenants, they are used to use their own car, so they hear some, for reasons, New York State, but MD. So they find it out where do this guy lives, but he is not an MD. So they found my address. Few days later, I got a letter from them. You know, this guy is living in your place. So they just want to do it out and get a paid bites from you. So just be careful how it is coming up. That's why you need umbrella coverage and protections and liability coverage from all sources. The gentleman who is talking about the sexual. It's very important talks. Just be careful. You know, how does it come it out? We said we our hands are down. Does it happen in your office? It does happen. So just be careful. Okay, I think uh one step they were to show my uh over question answer with the bar show one step or slay it's a question answer with the bar show it so we are not only doing it actually. And it won't be the market yesterday.
I really congratulate uh, New York chapter uh, BMA for arranging such an excellent uh, uh, program and for our practitioners and plus the future practitioners. I really thank you all and let's get the very much. Thank you. Thank you, David.
informing them and making aware what we should do as physicians, what is our code of conduct, all that. So I certainly believe that this was a very beneficial program organized by uh, Bangladesh Medical Association of North America, Yemen and New York chapter. I wish them all success and I wish they do more programs like this. Thank you. I came here to share my experience, chance for me to share my experience with all of you who are, who are uh, practicing and who got the, the new generation who are coming to practice. Because uh, when we go to medical school or when we do our residency, our whole mentality is around take care of my patient, how can I do my best to treat my patient, that's all. But when we finish our residency, that's the main game start. I am a child and adolescent and adult psychiatrist. <clears throat> I was in a solo practice. The most dangerous work for the doctors. And I didn't know anything about it because when we are medicine a medical school or when we were a resident. I just told you, we are all around medicine, but now, when you are in practice, it's not medicine anymore, it is a business. And as a student or resident, we don't know how to run a practice. So, I got into trouble because I didn't know all this risk management data we heard today from Dr. Zakia, Dr. Zabel, Fetos Khandukar, Dr. Yusuf. In my time, I didn't have this kind of seminar. You guys, the new generation, you guys are lucky to have BMA, New York chapter, who arranged this kind of fantastic sessions for you guys. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But anyway, Five years ago, I never thought I would be a ever able to come in front of you guys because I'm supposed to go behind bars for many, many years. But thank God, and by the grace of God, today I am in front of you guys and I have the courage to share my experience. Thank you. <laughs> Somehow, Department of Health or and OPHC, Office of Professional Misconduct, got some complaints from somebody, I don't know, maybe my patients. Can I ask you one question before you go? Sure. Do you have to disclose anything as of now? Yes, I am. Okay. And that's why I'm here. Okay. But Nasir, when the OPFC takes, because there is a written consent there, you cannot disclose this to anybody. Because I know that very well. Because okay. whenever the OPFC takes, you cannot discuss. That's a very okay. important Thank you for this yes, advice. So I will not share, but I will just tell to you guys, the doctors, you guys are the number one targets of the lawyers because you have a status in the society. If they can down you, they get promotion and they are one step ahead to Washington DC. So please doctors, the big brothers that are watching you, be careful. You are not safe and every single moment you have to be careful. The only thing I want to share then because I am not allowed, as Dr. Katya mentioned, 
Keep your faith up, work hard, and be good doctor. Don't be greedy, don't be a bad doctor, because if you are a brawler, awesome. I want to thank from our chapter, on behalf of our chapter, everybody who's here. I want to tell everybody's name, I wish I can, but I have a couple of names here. Dr. Nasrin Kader, Dr. Sheikh Hassan, Dr. Mojur Rahman Mojunda, Dr. Maksu Chowdhury, Dr. Niru Shohidullah, Dr. Chameen Shohidullah, Dr. Nuru Nisu, Reza, Dr. Reza Chowdhury, Dr. Zia Rahman, Dr. Roshid Rahman, Enamul Haq, Dr. Kabur, Dr. Wahid, I think I can tell many names, Dr. Tushar, Dr. Yusuf and everybody, I think, and our infectious disease specialty. I think she's the only one here from infectious disease specialty. TV, Chinese, Reza Way also, right? Reza Way also infectious disease specialist. So I, it was it, and our treasurer, Dr. Hadanapa, um, um, and Dr. Osman Bhai, Shabai, I can say, I should know Shabai, अनेक अनेक दोनों बात हम सवार एक तो इम्पोर्टेंट टाइम रोबर्ट का आजकल फैमिली का है मैं हम लोग इतने सवार एक साथ ही शेयर करने सवार के दोनों बात हम लोग चाहे हमारे दोनों हैं हमारे इधर सेकंड वर्कशॉप इन इन फ्यूचर आई थिंक वी कैन मोर कंट्रीब्यूट वी कैन मोर ऑर्गेनाइज्ड जाते � Queen's IPA, Dr. Ferdos from the government. Ebon, Tashate Amade, Aruji contribution to the morning star, accurate diagnostic. Dr. No, this is LM and New York Corporation. Mohammed A. Momin, Shikdar. Actually, I think he just left. So he has a Sidra medical supply. So we have all the information. Anybody need any supplies, please. You can inform the Rakal by or me, and we can help you out to get all this. And the New York Life. So we want to thank everybody, and we want to recognize any other people also. Jamun, Nehar Bhai, Shabsho Ma, our video. Uti, Shalpo Bhai, Shabsho Ma, only a volunteer organization to help. Kare, technician, Maro from our to help. Kare. So Shabsho Bhai, only only the man. No bar. Are you coming? I mean, I think that this is what our game is called. So, the first prize is total out of 40, it was 37. Second prize, second prize is 35. And third prize is 400 plus the game out of 10, 34. The first one is the chilo. So, I mean, we could be six monthly tour with all office employees. Then increase their salary and lunch and snacks in the evening and selection of the employee of the month with providing gift and their certificate. And that is, I think that is very important because next when they will apply for something like uh, some of the doctor's office, they are going for the um, PA, the kids are going for the PA also, some of them. So those certificates will be helpful for the future and asking feedback from the employee and arranging seminar for their uh, their staff for acknowledgement for the medical practices. So this one got like total 37 points. And second one, the 35 is a lunch break and give them some uh, lunch uh, money and give them some time for lunch. Uh, that is uh, the second, second. And third one, offer uh, free lunch, uh, snacks, pizza, so those are the three things, and everybody's contribution is general. Shabar at the show and all, you know. You want to say something? Yeah, I have one question. For that criteria, we see to get those things. Just, just for understanding. Okay. Um. Shampur Kapi, I be Felix. So I think the question asked here. I think I can talk to you about that. I prefer this to the other one that I pay the president. I want to give one of the other ideas. I want to give money to the money. For me, I pay the vice president. It's not really money right away. I want to maintain the quality. 
and you have to save the cost. I think Dr. Yabar wants to uh, share around something. Uh, Dr. Shantasan Nagar, to me, the will be happy. I'm going to start, and the uh, Kirtos will tell also, because uh, whenever the group owner joins the IPA, everybody thinks they are going to get a lot of money, a lot of incentive. They are going to get the money is the risk. It's true, but they have things. The member per PNTM per member per month, and also the funding. And second one is the physician cap. Uh, third one, fourth one is the uh, specialty cap, and then labs and other is incurred but not risky. I'm going to give one example. Suppose one one provider has a 200 patient, then per member per month funding is 200. And then he's getting like in per 200 per, per member, then the physician cap is like in 29 or 30 dollar per month. And uh, then the lab and, and auxiliary services, they are spending. And also the ER admission, hospital admission, pharmacy cost, this is very important. And if we don't follow the ER admission, hospital admission, and also the pharmacy, how much they are spending, and also the IBNR. IBNR means the patient went to the other state, and they will they got some the bills they come later on. And we have to follow everything. And if they, some of the uh, uh, provider they tell us like this patient never came to me, but even. You are the prime in, in their card officially. You are the primary care physician. Even patient never visited to you, but you are responsible for all this cost. And if you don't follow up, then you will be negative. And if you are negative, you are making the whole IPA negative. When the service fund will be distributed, and you are negative, and you are not going to get the money, and you are negative, uh, like uh, for uh, for your negativity you are making negative the whole IPA. And that's why this is very, very important to follow up your ER visit, hospital admission, pharmacy cost, and also the specialty services if you refer to the suppose you. And also you, you are sending to physical therapy and they are doing so, MRI, all these things, and it will be cut down from your budget. And this is very, very important for the system. Thank you. Thank you, Zakia Pai and Atal Bhai. Uh, I'm going to closely look at Atal Bhai. Atal Bhai is very aggressive in the management. Probably you agree. No, 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 patient management. The patient is not going to be able to do it. And the capitation is not going to be Say thirty dollars a month. After encounter nine patients, very simple. So, being a primary care physician, to bring this loop of $100 and make it to $130, just get the patient in your office once a year. Doesn't matter how old, doesn't matter where she is, just bring every member once a year regardless. premium she automatically do you have like a whole patient of one of me physical program, but they can act one or two. On a cable, a ghost patient, Patsina, Eglo, you keep trying it, try it, keep calling, send letters. I mean, to wash things, mine is probably sicker or being managed better. It's the same number of patients. Our original angle of the Pasho patient, me, Uno surplus nine minus sixty thousand dollar negative. Extra patient he is getting ten thousand dollar a month. You see that, right? So it's how you formulate. You know, shakalaj jokon jabe you tell yourself that what is your game plan? That is it. 
Sick patients, what do you do? How do you know if it is really sick, if the patient is eligible for home care, give home care. Let them enjoy the MLTC, that's fine. Or maybe the plants, those don't share your surplus with, put them there. What is the big deal about it? Before the deadline comes, it can be done too. And day to day also, when you see that this patient is walking through a big, those are the things. Think about it. I mean, so, uh, yes. So, 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 Probably this is the first time in the BMA. We are able to give an annual event calendar. It is our last five patients in an email text. We don't want to say that. Annual event calendar. So, I can say, Mr. Party has a gummy. I got a party. Saturday, I'm not a fan. You show my husband. You can be for a hobby. For a hobby, I'm not sure if I can be a fan. So, I'm not sure if I'm a convention. एक पूरे पिकनिक जी नाम रखी है चार अगस्त है इधर तो सारे तो टाइम तक में हम लोग ऑनलाइन एक तो डेडलाइन दे देंगे डेडलाइन ना तो लेता हमारा एरिस्ट में कॉलेज में इसलिए आप ही लगाएंगे इधर आपने क्या कहा था पूरा तारीख तो नहीं तो चाहिए ना कारण शॉकल पैंसो तार ताई दे तो हमारी शॉकल शॉकल इता बास एक जोड़ के दायित्व दिए थे उन्हें बांग्ला टूरिज्म हाबित भाई और उन्हरा इन्तो होटल एल ओवरनाइट स्टेज इता पोर्ट विलियम जिसके बारे में बोलते हैं उड़ा ओवरनाइट ठेके पॉरेट दिन कैंपफायर पॉरेट दिन जो क्रूज़र से लेक जोड़ते ये बापर अपना दर स्वाइज़ निताशुला शक्ति ऑनल कॉन्वेंशन एंड पांडे जी पॉकेट तक ना दिलो होगा एडवर्टाइज़ योगर पूरी दिलो हम लोग शॉपिंग के फ्लायर एडवर्ट पिक ना इफ्तारे हम लोग एडवर्टाइज़ दे फॉर्म दिवो पांडे जी के फॉर्म ही में तो हमारा तो स्टेन का एक आंसर होता है इधर उसे कॉल करना हम लोग हमारे सामान्य बेशिन अपना कॉन्वेंशन इंफेक्शन डिजीज़ डिपार्टमेंट है आपसे एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन इंफेक्शन है तो आप आधे ना बोल रहे हैं कि रिपोर्ट रिपोर्ट तो चीज़ है किसी किसी इंफेक्शन डिजीज़ जैसे आमादे के डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ हेल्थ के रूटीन भी इनफॉर्म करता है जब चिबोर टुलोस